Educational Neuroscience. So this lecture series aims to honor both world-renowned scientists and also help form a bridge between scientific communities here at Gallaudet, in Washington, D.C., and across the nation. This series is hosted by Gallaudet University and the PhD in Educational Neurosciences program, and our theme this year is Breaking Down Barriers. Thank you for joining us here today. Thank you to those of, us, those of you who are watching via the live stream online. Hello. And thank you for coming here from across the city or from other universities. Thank you all for joining us. Today we are delighted and honored to have Dr. Nathan Fox accept our invitation as a distinguished lecturer. Dr. Fox is a distinguished university professor and chair of the Department of Human Development and Quantitative Methodology at the University of Maryland. And he is director of the Child Development Lab. Dr. Fox earned his bachelor's degree at Williams College and his PhD in psychology at Harvard University. Dr. Fox is internationally known for his important work investigating the social and emotional development of infants and children. His groundbreaking research about the effects of social deprivation on the developing child is truly one of a kind. As we'll hear from him shortly, this research project has yielded high impact um, outcomes, sorry, high impact insights regarding the neuroscience, the behavior, and the mental health of children who experience social deprivation, as well as the ways that they can overcome this deprivation. As our inaugural lecture for this year's series with the theme of breaking down barriers, Dr. Nathan Fox will present on the effects of deprivation on the developing brain and behavior, lessons from the Bucharest Early Intervention Project. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Nathan Fox here as our distinguished lecturer. It is our great pleasure and honor to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for coming and welcome to Gallaudet. Thank you. You're gonna stand next to me. So um, can everybody hear me or see me and uh, uh, out there in the studio audience as well, I hope. Um, first, let me uh, thank you for inviting me to be the first speaker in your uh, lecture series. Um, uh, it's an honor. I, I will admit something um, which is rather embarrassing. Um, I've been at the University of Maryland in College Park for about 30 years, and I've never been on the Gallaudet campus until today. Um, I, I think that that's right. I think that that is, you know, a sin on my part, but it also, um, you know, it speaks to the, uh, to the silos that we sometimes uh, set up in science in turn, and the bridges that need to uh, be built. Um, and I'm especially thankful to uh, Professor Laura, Laura Ampetito for inviting me and for her establishing this uh, PhD in educational neuroscience because I think it's really going to uh, lead, I can see already from the wonderful conversations that I've had today with faculty and students, uh, I could see the possibilities for links between faculty at the University of Maryland College Park um, and faculty here, students at College Park, and students here. And so I'm hoping that not only is this the inaugural lecture uh, for this year's series, but it's really the beginning of uh, communication uh, and interaction uh, between our two campuses um, and uh, between faculty uh, at both universities who are interested in common problems uh, having to do with language and neuroscience. So really, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about 
um, a project called the Bucharest Early Intervention Project. But really, um, what I am interested in talking to you about today is the effects of adversity on brain and behavioral development. And I'm going to frame my talk um, with regard to the notion that is very common among neuroscientists, less so uh, among developmental psychologists and, uh, and child development people, about sensitive and critical periods in development and the importance of understanding these sensitive uh, and critical periods as we think about interventions um, and as we think about the impact of experience on the developing brain and behavior. So let me first start with a definition of sensitive periods. I'm taking this definition from a wonderful paper that a neuroscientist by the name of Eric Knudsen, uh, he published in the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience, I think it was in 2000. I may be mistaken about that, but Eric defines sensitive periods as, uh, as time-limited periods of time uh, during which the effect of experience on the brain is particularly strong. Um, and he also said that these sensitive periods uh, or critical periods allow experience to instruct the neural circuitry to process information in an adaptive way, and that they provide information that is essential for normal development um, and may alter performance permanently. Uh, now, what Knudsen goes on to do in this wonderful paper of his is he uh, proposes a number of different ways in, or a number of different mechanisms in which brain architectural changes uh, may occur which underlie sensitive periods. And I just put them up there uh, just so that uh, you know that it, this is an ongoing debate in the neuroscience literature of exactly how sensitive periods emerge, how they close, and as I'll mention now, some really exciting work on how they, in fact, may reopen. So let's go back in time. The real uh, in terms of psychology, the, the notion of sensitive periods was first discussed by ethologists, um, uh, Conrad Lorenz, uh, who talked about uh, imprinting. There you see him with the baby ducklings, and I'm sure you all know about you know, that story about how the ducklings imprinted to Lorenz because uh, when they first hatched, he was the first thing that they saw uh, move. Now, really, in terms of neuroscience, the work, the Nobel work of uh, Jubel and Wiesel was really the first to really uh, demonstrate the presence of sensitive periods, particularly for the visual system. You may remember that they worked with kittens and cats and showed that the effects of early uh, visual deprivation uh, in striate cortex. So you can see there uh, at the top, and uh, panel A, you can see there that there's a, uh, a normal striate cortex for normal binocular vision. And you can see the disruption in striate cortex that occurs uh, when you have a monocular deprivation. They did this both in kittens and in non-human primates uh, to demonstrate the effects of timing of that visual experience on the development of these, of these brain areas that are associated with visual perception. Um, it's interesting, in terms of human work, that a developmental psychologist by the name of Daphne Maurer, who's at McMaster University, Daphne took an experiment of nature. These were infants that were born with bilateral cataracts. Um, and at the time that she first started her study, um, the age at which these infants receive the surgery to remove their cataracts varied because neuro-ophthalmologists had not really perfected the surgery. And so she could find a population of infants for whom that surgery occurred at different points in time over the first year of life. Um, and she reasoned that that's very much like the deprivation that Jubel and Wiesel had 
experimentally manipulated uh, in the kittens, and she wanted to see whether or not the effects of this deprivation had an effect upon the infant's visual perception. And in fact, she found that it did. What's more interesting, or what's as interesting, is that she found that these, what she called in a wonderful paper, sleeper effects, which are the fact that when she followed these infants into adolescence, what she found is that the early experience, or the early deprivation that they had experienced, uh, established a neural substrate, or the lack of a neural substrate, for these capabilities that were only able to be assessed later in adolescence. Um, and she found that, in fact, 14 years later, children whose cataracts were removed, for example, late in infancy, were deficient in certain types of face processing, something that we couldn't have known had we not followed these infants uh, into adolescence. She called that a sleeper effect. Now, uh, Knudsen, who I mentioned to you uh, earlier, he works with barn owls, um, and he manipulates the auditory and visual experience of these barn owls, identifying the sensitive periods for the inputs that the barn, owl, uh, uh, barn owls need as they develop and integrate this auditory and visual information. And there's an area of the brain that he studies called the optic tectum, which is uh, the area in the barn owl's brain that integrates um, this visual and auditory information. And I'd love to show this slide because this is the way that uh, Knudsen manipulates visual experience, puts these prisms on the baby barn owls to distort their visual uh, field and visual information. Or he plugs up their auditory canal so that they can hear at different ages, and he finds that the timing of visual and auditory experience is important in terms of the integration of these two sensory modalities. The other person who I just wanted to briefly mention, and I hear that uh, she may, she'll be coming here to talk to you, is Marina Bedney, who is at uh, Hopkins. And she's studied uh, individuals who are congenitally blind. And she's found that when she uh, plays language to them while they're in the scanner, that in fact, um, they hear language in their visual cortex, right? Their visual, not only do the language areas light up, but also areas of visual cortex. And this relates to something that Yubo and Wiesel talked about, which is the sparing, if you will, of certain brain areas where, which do not receive the kind of experiences that they expect to receive early in life. Um, the other aspect, which I'm sure you all know about, is Janet Worker's work. Um, in which she finds that there are timing effects for infants being able to identify these contrasts across different languages, and that these timing effects disappear over the first year of life. Um, and one of the things that Janet found is that by nine and 10 months of age, infants, before nine and 10 months of age, infants can discriminate the sounds of all languages, but by the end of the first year, they're really only able to discriminate uh, the languages that they hear in their environment. And in a wonderful paper that she published 10 or 11 years ago, 12 years, 12, 11 years ago now, um, she proposed that there are, there's not one sensitive period for language, but each of the different aspects of language, phonetic categories, phonological categories, and so forth, may in fact have their own sensitive periods in which experience plays an important role for the development of these processes. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. OK, the final piece that I want to tell you about is the wonderful work currently now of Takao Hench, who's at Harvard. And he asks the question, can we reopen uh, sensitive periods? And uh, in fact, in some spectacular work, which I really won't have a time to tell you about today, he finds that, in fact, yes, he can uh, pharmacologically manipulate in the mouse um, uh, the areas in visual cortex which are associated with the closing of sensitive periods to reopen them. Um, and that's rather remarkable sort of scientific, scientific fantasy kind of work. Now the general conclusion though that we have from the work on sensitive periods 
is that at least for sensory uh, processes, auditory and visual processes, there seem to be evidence for uh, sensitive periods. But many of us, many of us study more complex behaviors. And so it's not clear whether or not cognitive or social, social emotional behaviors have similar sensitive periods as do the sensitive pro uh, 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 sensory processes that I've just told you about. Most of the information that we have about the presence of the importance of timing is uh, inferences that we have from uh, longitudinal or correlational kinds of studies. So with that in mind, we approach the Bucharest Early Intervention Project, and let me tell you a little bit about that. And you'll see why it frames this question of sensitive or critical periods in development. OK, so first some, some background. The first is that um, what about the history of Romania? Romania was ruled by a communist dictator, Nicolae Ceausescu, from the mid-60s till when he was deposed in December of 1989. He believed that the way to increase uh, human capital in Romania was to increase the population. And so you can see on the slide there that he had a number of things that he did in order to increase human capital, which was to ban contraception and abortion, to put a tax on families that did not have enough children, and to uh, reward families that did have lots of children. Um, the result of, the, of these policies was a uh, whole, wholesale in the country child abandonment. Um, and it really became a national disaster. The families uh, were really decimated. Um, and people who could not afford to take care of these many children were told that they could put them into institutions and that the institutions would take care of them until they were uh, uh, economically able to bring the child back. So when we think about children, at least in Romania, who were living in institutions. We often call them orphans. But the definition of an orphan is really where both parents are no longer alive, they're dead. And in many cases, the infants and children that were living in the institutions in Romania had two parents that were alive. But, and in some instances, those parents had not uh, given up the legal rights for that child. Um, they just left them there with the idea that the uh, state and that the institution was going to raise the child and when the child was able to uh, when they were able to bring the child back into the family or afford the child back into the family that they can come and pick the child up. Now the when Ceausescu was overthrown in December of 1989 there are over a hundred thousand children who were warehoused in these uh, in these institutions as I said poverty was the number one reason uh, many uh, people from the United Kingdom, the United States, uh, and Canada went over to uh, Romania to adopt uh, these children, but by and large, they were unprepared for the kinds of behaviors that they would uh, uh, encounter. And because of international pressure, very soon after, Romania had to ban international, or did ban international adoption, and so the children that were living in these institutions had nowhere to go. Now, what was institutional uh, living for these children like? Well, there are a couple of things to say. First of all, they had a roof over their head, they had clothing, and they were fed. But it was very routinized. They went to the toilet t at the same time. They were fed at the same time. They were bathed at the same time. Um, there was no training of any of the caregivers uh, in terms of child development or interaction. Um, and the staff was basically negligent of the children um, while they were living uh, in these institutions. Um, and I brought with me um, a video. I'll just show you a short piece of it, which we actually took when we first started our study. Um, and this is uh, in one of the toddler rooms in St. Catharines, um, in the uh, institution that we were working at uh, in uh, Romania. 
Now, there are a couple of things that I'd like you to note. The first is what you should be noting is the stereotypies, the motor stereotypies that the infants are showing, right? This rocking back and forth. The other thing is, for those of you who have ever coded social behavior, uh, we have a code that we use which is called aimless wandering. Um, if you go into a daycare center, you see that the kids are playing with each other. There's very little, except aggressive, social uh, interaction that's going on among the, among the children. That lady there is the cleaning lady who is uh, working with the kids. Okay, so that's the life of the children in the institutions. Um, and we set out, um, as part of a, an effort with the a MacArthur Network on Early Experience and Brain Development, we set out to uh, examine uh, the effects of this early adversity on the children's uh, behavior. And we were also interested in affecting an intervention um, where we would take some of the children out and place them into families and see whether or not this intervention was successful in ameliorating some of the deficits that we expected to find. But the third piece of our uh, initiative, which is the frame of my talk, is we were also interested in seeing whether or not the timing of that intervention, whether there were sensitive periods during which time the effects of that intervention had a greater effect than at other periods of time, which would be evidence for a sensitive period for a particular domain. Okay. So here's what the design of the study was. There were six institutions in Bucharest. We assessed the children who were under the age of two who were living in those. We had criteria um, for who we were going to assess. We did not include children who had special needs or Down syndrome or cerebral palsy. Um, once we had assessed them, we randomized the, these children to one of two conditions. One group of children were taken out of the institution and each child was placed into a family that we had recruited and selected and interviewed. The other group of children remained where they were. We didn't randomize them to go to an institution. They were living in the institutions at the time. So they just remained where they were. We call that group of children the care as usual, C-A-U-G. We call the other group of children, the FCG, the children who were placed into uh, family care or foster care. Um, we also recruited a community control group. These were children who had never been institutionalized and were living with their own families um, in uh, Bucharest. We call that the never institutionalized group or the NIG. And what we did is we followed these children prospectively over time. And we had multiple domains of assessment. There's a long list of what those domains are. I'm not going to be able to tell you, obviously, about all of these domains. I'm happy to talk about some of them uh, during the question and answer period. But you can see here that there's a long list of domains. In part, that was because there were three principal investigators. And we all had our favorite uh, domains of assessment that we were interested in, and in part, quite seriously, we wanted to be as thorough and comprehensive as we could be because we really didn't know which domains would be most affected by the intervention. And we also really didn't know about sensitive periods uh, during which the intervention might have the greatest effect. Uh, and so while we had some notion about that, we wanted to cover the range of domains um, and as you can see there, it went for everything from physical development all the way down to social competence and, and psychopathology. So the general hypotheses of the study were that institutional real, uh, 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 rearing would have a profound effect upon children's behavior, uh, their cognitive and social emotional development, that removing the children from the institutions and placing them into families would remediate some of those deficits, some if not all of those deficits, um, and that the age or timing of placement would be a significant factor 
in explaining the intervention effects, though as I put up here, um, that may function, uh, that may be a function of a different domains. So for some domains there may be one sensitive period and for other domains there may be another. Okay, so now I'm going to go on to the data and I'm going to present to you some of the findings that we've accumulated over these past years in terms of looking at each of these domains. The first domain that I've chosen to look at uh, are two domains are language and cognition and I'm going to first start with language, although I, I will say that our assessments of language were not as sophisticated as the kinds of assessments that you probably do here. Um, we um, looked at uh, language in both the foster care group um, and the care as usual group. Um, and we looked at the age of placement into age of uh, foster care placement. So this may not be very clear. It's the Raynell scales of expressive and receptive language. Um, and the gray bars are expressive language. The red bars are receptive language. The zero line is normal. Right, so that's the standardized, uh, what a typical child would be for that particular age. And what you can see there is that if you were in the foster care and you were taken out before 15 months of age, then you were, uh, your expressive and receptive language was uh, non-significantly different from typical, uh, typical children. Um, that was Somewhat true, but less so if you were taken out after 16 months of age. By 24 months of age, it's no longer true. If you're taken out at 24 months of age or more, you're very much like the children who remained in the institution in terms of significant delay in both receptive and expressive language. Now, um, when we looked at mean length of utterance, uh, at 42 months of age, we found another sensitive period here. Here's the community controls. These are for words and morphemes. Here are foster care children who are taken out before 24 months of age, no different from the community controls. Here are foster care children who are taken out after 24 months of age, and the children who are randomized to remain in the institution. They are no different from each other, but significantly different from the other two groups. And finally, in terms of language, at eight years, we had an assessment of reading. And what you can see here is, again, a timing effect. These are the uh, children who are randomized to remain in the institution. These are the children who were taken out, but after 24 months of age. And in the sort of pale green, those are the children who were taken out and placed into families before 24 months of age. So there's a timing effect uh, here with the children being taken out before two years of age looking uh, more typical like the community controls compared to even the children who were taken out but after two years of age. Um, if we look at IQ, um, we're beginning, we're, we're going to start seeing a, a, a similar theme. Right? So here's the, here are the IQ scores of the infants while they were still living in the institution. We use the Bailey scales of mental development, which is mean at 100, standard deviation of 15. What you can see there in green are the community controls. They have a mean of 100, which is what you would sort of expect. You might expect it to be a little bit higher, but you know, it's mean at, mean at 100, so they're doing fine. But all of the children who were assessed, who were living at that time in the institution, their mean is 64. That is significant, uh, standard deviation of 15. These kids are seriously delayed in their uh, Bailey MDI scores uh, at, this, at this particular time. Now remember, all of these infants are currently living in the institution. Um, if we now look at the intervention effects, Here's what we find. We find at 30, 42, and 54 months, if you're taken out of the institution and placed into a family, you have a higher IQ score than if you are randomized to remain in the institution and you remain in the institution. 
I will say that unless I tell you differently, all of the analyses that I'm going to be presenting to you are with an approach that's called intent to treat. Now, um, you, you may be familiar with it, but I'll just tell you, for those who are not, let me just tell you for just a second. It's something which is used in, in clinical trials. Because what happens is that you, know, you randomize uh, participants to one group or another, but over time, they may leave that group. Um, when you do your analysis, though, you can treat them in an intent to treat analysis as if they still remain in the same group um, that they were originally randomized to. Um, and that's important because most of the children in the, who were randomized to remain in the institution were no longer there after about four or five years. And some of the children who had been randomized to be placed into our foster care families left and were not there either. So if I show you intent to treat data, it's as if they still existed in the same groups that they had been originally randomized to. So this answers the first question. It says that yes, that there is an intervention effect up through 54 months of age. I should mention that we supported the families that we had selected and that we assigned each child to up through the child being 54 months of age. Um, we had social workers and gave them material support and financial support. All of that stopped when the child was 54 months of age and then the government took over the support of that family. The next question that I'm going to ask of these data is whether there's a timing effect. And here's that data. Um, and what you can see is that there clearly is, right? So here are the cutoffs. Here are the children taken off. This is just within the foster care group. Here are the children taken out below 18 months of age, 18 to 24 months of age, 24 to 30, and older than 30. And what you can see here is that there's a clear break point at around two years of age, right? So if you're taken out of the institution, and placed into a family before two years of age, your IQ is in the normal range. Uh, if you're taken out after two years of age, then your IQ is significantly lower. All right? So again, evidence for a sense of period. Now when we followed these kids up at age eight, here's what we found. We found that uh, we lost the full-scale IQ effect that in fact there was still a, an intervention effect for verbal processing, but uh, not for any of the other subscales and not for full scale IQ. The intervention effect had disappeared um, and there was no timing effect. So that was sort of discouraging for us. Um, what we did is uh, we broke, this is intent to treat, we broke intent to treat and we looked at the children who remained in our families. We call that MAC foster care because the MacArthur Foundation funded uh, the initial part of our, of our study. Um, so those are the kids in green. There were kids that were uh, placed into government foster care and kids that remained in the institution. This is at age eight. You can see there are very few kids who are still in the institution. But you can see there that the children that remained in our families over this period of time had higher full-scale IQ, processing speed, working memory, and verbal processing, right? So the lesson here is that it's not only uh, the intervention, um, but it's also the stability of placement in that intervention over that time that's leading to the enhanced uh, IQ scores in these families. But not to be deterred, we've just looked at our, actually it's just um, uh, coming out in developmental psychology, uh, we looked at the 12-year IQ scores of the sample, and what you can see there is that remarkably, 10 years after randomization uh, and eight years after the the, we stop supporting the families, there still is, and this is intent to treat, 
there still is a significant effect of the intervention uh, on IQ uh, uh, in our sample. Um, and since we're interested in intervention, we looked at the sort of the pattern of stability of uh, these children over time. So that's starting at 30 months and going all the way through uh, uh, 12 years. And you can see that for the foster care group, there were two groups. There was a group of children that remained high over the entire period of time, and a group of children that really remained low. Okay? If we look at the care as usual group, those are the kids that were randomized to remain in the institution. There were two groups, both of which sort of showed decreasing IQ scores over time, one that started a bit higher than, than the other. But um, also interesting, there was a group of children that actually showed you know, increased scores over that period of time. And if we look at what are the predictors of, uh, within the foster care group of the children who remained high and stable over time, it was attachment status at 42 months, which I'll tell you about in just a second. Age of placement, so evidence for a sensitive period there. And number of disruptions. Number of disruptions means how many times was a child moved out of the initial placement. And we know from the foster care literature here in the United States that the best predictor of bad outcome for children in foster care is the number of times that they move from one placement to another. And these data just echo that uh, in our Bucharest sample. OK, so this sort of just summarizes that and says that remarkably 10 years after the intervention began, there's still positive effects on IQ. OK, I know I'm going quickly, but I want to get through a bunch of data for you. So now let me talk about attachment. Um, we did the strange situation procedure on the children while they were living in the institution, all of them. Now, uh, I don't know if you all know what the strange situation procedure is, but it was developed by Mary Ainsworth many years ago, and it involves the child uh, being uh, uh, observed during a series of separations and reunions with their caregiver, their mother in Ainsworth's situation, or their attachment caregiver, and a stranger. So you may ask yourself, well, for the children living in the uh, institution, who was their mother? Who was their caregiver? And the answer is, we did that by committee. We gathered all of the uh, workers, the caregiver workers, and we said, OK, here's child number one. Who is that child's favorite caregiver? And that, whoever was nominated, that was the child's caregiver for the strange situation procedure. And we videotaped them. And uh, when we force classified them, we found that the majority of the children uh, in the strange situation had very disorganized kinds of behavior uh, and attachments to that caregiver. And indeed, the people who um, coded these videos, we sent the videos to the mecca of attachment coding, to the University of Minnesota, um, Betty Carlson um, was the primary coder. And I remember she wrote us an email and she said, look, I've been coding strange situation videos from all over the world. I've never seen any behavior like this before. I don't think we should classify these kids this way. I think that what we should do is we should have a continuous score and we should say if there's any pattern that's, been, that's recognizable, we'll give them a five. And then you can see here one through four are these sort of odd behaviors that had never been seen before uh, in this strange situation. And when you look at the data this way, what you see is that 100% of the community sample is getting a five, but only 3% of the infants that are living in the institution have any discernible, recognizable patterns of behavior in this strange situation. right? Um, Bowlby, who wrote about attachment, really didn't even talk about not being attached. He talked about variations in attachment, as did Ainsworth. But this is really uh, saying that these children had not been able to form any kind of relationship uh, with an adult 
human. Um, okay, so I'm asking two questions. The first question, was there an intervention effect? And the next question is, was there a timing effect? So in terms of their, uh, the first question, is there an intervention effect? The answer is yes. You can see there that in the uh, institutional sample, this is at 42 months of age, that there's a significantly higher incidence of insecure attachment, whereas in the foster care, it's now about 50-50. And in the community, you have much higher incidence of security of attachment than not. So there is an intervention effect, both for security of attachment and also for organization of attachment. The second question is, is there a timing effect? And the answer there is yes also, very similar to the data that I showed you in terms of IQ. Um, what you can see here is that there's a cut point. So that if you're taken out before 24 months of age, you're more likely to have a secure attachment if you're taken out after 24 months of age and placed into a uh, family much less likely to form a secure attachment. Okay. Um, the other thing that we did is we also looked at what is, was a very commonly reported behavior. It's called indiscriminant behavior. Um, these are children that will walk off with anyone. And it's reported in the literature that children who have experienced institutionalization will do that. And so we developed an a, a, um, a instrument called Stranger at the Door. I won't have time to go into it, but basically we wanted to see whether the child would go off with a stranger. Um, and what we found is that if you were um, a child who was randomized to the institution, you were much more likely to go off with a stranger than if you were in the family care or obviously the community controls. And if we looked at timing, we find that within the foster care group, those children who were taken out before 24 months of age, um, that indiscriminate behavior all but disappeared once they had, once they were placed into the family. It took longer for children who were placed after 24 months of age. Okay. Um, the final piece in my social emotional is about competence. Um, we were interested at age 12 in asking who's a competent child. Uh, and we used all of these domains, as you can see there, everything from risky behaviors to academic performance to talk about competence. And you can see there that a high score, which is what the community controls have, signify that you're a competent child at age 12. Um, and what we find um, is an intervention effect, that about 50% of the foster care children are showing these competent behaviors where, versus only 21, 22% of the care as usual group are uh, showing competent behaviors. And if we ask whether or not timing is a factor here, the answer uh, is yes. Here the cut point is 20 months of age. So if you're placed by age 20 months, you're much more likely to be uh, uh, evaluated as a competent child than if you're placed after 20 months of age. Okay. Um, one of the things that we did in the, uh, this study was also look at the brain, um, and I'm not going to have too much time to tell you about that, but I want to go through quickly some of the uh, data that we have from that. We set up a, a laboratory with uh, a, the ability to measure uh, EEG, electroencephalogram, and ERPs uh, in the institution. Um, and when we looked at uh, the children, uh, while they were still living in the institution. What we found is that this is the typical community sample. They're showing a pattern of high alpha activity, which is what you would expect. But it's as if uh, someone had taken a dimmer switch and turned down the, the electrical activity of these uh, children uh, in this alpha range. It was almost absent of that. Now, we did not see uh, an intervention or timing effect until the children were eight years old. But by eight years old, here are the community controls. Here are the children taken out before 24 months of age. There are the children from the uh, care as usual. And there are the children taken out after 24 months of age. And what you can see there 
is there's not only an intervention effect, but there's a time effect as well. Okay. Um, remarkably, this uh, effect of uh, intervention persists through age 12, although we lose the timing effect, right? So even though the foster care children are showing the more typical pattern of alpha activity across the scalp compared to the care as usual children, um, they are, it, the timing effect that I showed you now at age eight is no longer there. Um, we were also fortunate enough to do MRI, structural imaging, and um, that allowed us to look at gray and white matter and also at white matter tracks in the brain. Um, and just to show you, there was no intervention effect for gray matter uh, uh, at all. This is the, the institutionalized, the foster care compared to the never institutionalized. No, no intervention effect and obviously no timing effect. For white matter, there was a hint of an intervention effect with the foster care children sort of in between, between the community controls and the institutionalized sample. Um, and those differences were in an area of the brain called the corpus callosum, which is the area that connects the white matter tracks that connect the two hemispheres. We also did something called diffusion tensor imaging. I know I'm going pretty fast, but we were interested in measuring white matter tracks. Um, and there are two measures. Um, I'll be happy to talk about them in the question and answer period. One of them is fractional anisotropy, and the one is mean diffusivity. Um, and what we found was that, in fact, there were intervention effects, that the foster care children had white matter tracks that were more similar to the community controls compared to the children who were randomized to remain uh, in uh, the institution. And this is intent to treat here. Okay, so these are the conclusions about brain. Um, and you can see here that it had a differential effect on gray and white matter. Um, that some white matter tracks seem to be remediated. Um, and the bottom line message here is that early neglect, which is really what these children are experiencing in the institution, leads to dramatic changes in brain structure. White but not gray matter showed improvement with family care. Um, and We've also looked at the links between these brain changes and behavior. There's some evidence uh, to say that these brain changes are associated with the incidence of ADHD, attention deficit disorder, in the children. Um, although one of the things that we're very interested in now looking is whether or not these brain changes are associated with executive function. Okay, my last area or domain is really, um, on some level, uh, the most mechanistic, I think, in terms of thinking about how can these early adverse experiences affect both brain and behavior in the way they have, in the way that I've showed you. Um, and um, uh, and the area that I'm going to end with is about stress and stress responsivity. So we know that disruptions in stress responsivity from animal work in particular um, are thought to be a central mechanism by which exposure to early life environments influences human development. We have evidence that caregivers play a critical role in buffering stress early in life, and that early regulation of stress responses may have a lasting response on the stress system as it develops over childhood. And so we assessed stress reactivity in our sample. Um, we did a number of tasks. I'm really only going to be talking about the Trier social, uh, social stress test. Um, uh, but we measured autonomic activity across these different stress tasks as well as uh, cortisol. We did blood pressure, heart rate, and heart rate variability, and something called impedance cardiography, which allowed us to look at 
sympathetic activity. Um, and we also measured, we also collected saliva um, and got cortisol, which is a stress hormone, right? So elevations in cortisol are associated with uh, more stress responsivity. So the question is, how does the early environment shape autonomic activity and HPA axis activity? As I mentioned to you, I'm only going to be telling you about the Trier test, but the Trier test had a number of different uh, uh, parts to it, preparation, children had to give a speech, they were told that they had to give a speech, that they were going to be evaluated for the speech, that they were, they were criticized while they were giving the speech. Um, then they had to have this math task in which they had to count backwards by sevens as fast as they can from the number 1073. So it was pretty stressful uh, for the kids. And all of this time we're measuring autonomic activity and we've taken saliva to look at cortisol. Okay? Here's what we found. Here's heart rate. I'm going to show you the autonomic measures, but they all show the same pattern. Uh, here's speech preparation, here's the speech task, here's the math task. The dark bar are the community controls. The gray bar are the children, tend to treat now, who are uh, randomized to the foster care uh, group. And the white bar are the children randomized to care as usual. Um, and what you can see there is that if you are a community control and you're put into this Trier stress test, you're stressed out. Right? You show elevated heart rate uh, during the speech and the math parts. If you are a child who was randomized to remain in the institution, this is now age 12. And so remember, the majority of the children are no longer living in the institution, but we're still counting them as if they do in this intent to treat analysis. You are stress hypo-responsive. You're not showing stress response and heart rate at all. If you're in the foster care group, you're in between, right? You're showing something of a stress response, although it's not as strong as the community controls. That's true for heart rate. It's true for blood pressure, systolic and diastolic blood pressure. It's true for sympathetic activity. That's this measure of impedance cardiography, right? Here are the community controls. They're showing the greatest increase in sympathetic activity, which is a measure of stress. If you look at cortisol, the solid line are the community controls. They're showing a typical cortisol response to the Trier stress test, an elevation with increasing stress and then a decrease. And you can see that the two groups, uh, the two institutionalized groups, even the foster care kids, are showing this blunted response. But wait, if we look at timing, right, if we look at the timing in which the foster care children are taken out of the institution, what do we see? We see that the children that are taken out before 24 months of age, I'll go backwards, see if I can go backwards here, they look, they're showing a normal uh, cortisol response compared to the children taken out before. Let me see if I can go backwards here. Yes. Right? Here are the community controls. That's their solid black line. Here are the, the, the solid black line are those children taken out before 24 months of age in terms of their stress response 10 years later. Right? And what you can see there is that they're showing a typical response. So not only is it the intervention, but it's also the timing of that intervention. It's important. Um, and that was also true for our site. So, stress, psychosocial deprivation is associated with blunted physiological response. Uh, random assignment to high quality family care following institutionalization mitigates the otherwise persistent effects of early psychosocial deprivation. And earlier age replacement leads to normalization of cortisol and vagal engagement. Uh, during social tasks. Okay, so these are the summary of these findings, but let me sort of summarize them in a table for you. I started out by talking about sensitive periods, and I'm going to end with sensitive periods, and I'm going to show you the following data. 
I'm going to show you where we found sensitive periods in these very complex uh, domains. Then I'm going to show you the domains where there was no sensitive period and uh, the domains that were unaffected by the intervention. And I'm going to end with some thoughts about why we see the pattern of results the way we do. So first, why is it that these timing effects have, any, uh, have the impact that they do? So what is not happening in the caregiver-child relationship to each of these domains. How much of the effects come from this rotation of caregivers and not having a permanent caregiver? How much of the effects are general lack of stimulation and interaction? And how much are the effects from absence of holding, lack of response to distress, lack of reciprocal interaction, all of the things that infants typically expect in terms of their social interaction in the first year uh, of life. Okay, here are the domains with a sensitive period. Here are domains with no sensitive period but intervention effects. I told you about some of them, right? Here are the domains that are seemingly unaffected by early adversity. We were talking about uh, face processing earlier today. Um, we s assessed face processing in these children. Um, at each of the different age points, but we found no evidence that face processing, emotion recognition, face recognition, judgment of attributes about faces had any, uh, was affected by early adversity. Um, we also found domains that were unaffected by the intervention, particularly attention deficit disorder, uh, externalizing problems, Ex uh, executive function, and gray matter. And I must tell you that the executive function finding is very, uh, uh, well, troubling is not the word, but um, we, we really don't totally understand it because executive functions are thought to emerge from prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex seems to be developing in early childhood through middle childhood, or even some people say up through adolescence. Um, and that's when you measure executive functions, you see that curve. Yet, children who were, uh, had this early adverse experiences seem to be significantly affected in terms of their uh, ability to do uh, executive functions. So here's what we don't know, you know, in truth in lending, a truth in transparency. Um, we don't know why some domains like IQ and EEG show timing effects early on, and then those timing effects disappear. Um, we don't know, I just mentioned, why some domains like ADHD um, or executive function are unaffected by the intervention. Um, and we don't know why some domains like face processing appear to be spared. But what we do know is that early adverse uh, experiences like neglect have a profound effect upon multiple domains of behavior and that important domains like attachment and social relationships are significantly remediated if children are taken out early and provided with family kinds of environments. So overall conclusions, children raised in institutions demonstrate significant impairment, I just told you that, and we demonstrate specific cognitive deficits that are associated with those experiences. Insofar as we've been able to look at our data, our model of foster care as an intervention appears to be effective in ameliorating many of the negative consequences, and some aspects of brain structure and function, particularly white matter and EEG, are remediated in children, placed into foster care whereas others, particularly uh, gray matter, are not. Okay, this is the, I, I did not do all of this work uh, by myself. I had two wonderful, have two wonderful collaborators, Charles Zena, who is a child psychiatrist at Tulane University, um, and Charles Nelson, who is at Harvard Medical School and Children's Hospital Boston. We were supported in the initial part of the study by the MacArthur Foundation, 
And for the last uh, seven years, we've had funding from the NIH, National Institute of Health. Now, you might ask yourself, why is the National Institute of Health interested in the effects of institutionalization uh, in Romania? And really, the answer I hope that I've convinced you with is that this is really more about the effects of neglect on the developing brain and behavior. Neglect is the most common form of maltreatment in the United States. So to the extent that our data can inform policy, not only worldwide with institutionalization, but with neglect here in the United States, I think that uh, the research will have some impact. So with that, I will thank you for your attention and hope to get some questions. Thank you. That was amazing. And the number of different uh, areas of research that you've combined into this one project is just astounding. Um, I want to welcome everyone to come up and uh, ask a question, um, give a comment. So please um, let us know what you think. Yes, please come up here. Thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, and it made me think of another uh, recent study from a colleague who studied the effect of SES on math, on arithmetic. We know that SES uh, has, uh, a, lot of, uh, has a, a strong effect on math outcome in uh, children from low SES. And what they found is that they studied um, children, adolescents, young adolescents, in simple arithmetic tasks. And they compared low SES with um, children from better um, home, homes, and they found that performance was the same. However, the brain networks recruited by the two groups were substantially different. So uh, higher SES kids were recruiting verbal strategies, which are, which are thought to be more um, efficient for arithmetic, at least the ones that they were testing, whereas low SES were using more visual spatial and quantity processing. So at that level, it appeared that both groups behaviorally were the same, but from a neural um, network, brain networks, they were substantially different. And maybe I was thinking whether something along these lines could have affected uh, the, diff the non-difference observed on IQ in your 12-year-old uh, uh, testing. Uh, so the two groups were the same, right, at 12 years of age. No, actually, we did find have an intervention effect at age 12. But it was... Wasn't it um, that there was no um, time of uh, one intervention? There's no timing, right. So I was wondering whether that yeah, could have been part yeah, no, of the... Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Right. Um, right. So, uh, yes. So that's a great uh, uh, point about why the timing differences may disappear. Um, because really what you're, what you're saying is, and it's something that we know from the neuroscience literature is that there are many avenues to get to adequate performance. And some of those avenues involve compensation or development of compensatory circuits, right? And so it is possible that some of the children or the children who were taken out later, right, who earlier had very poor performance, that they've developed these compensatory strategies and compensatory neural networks which uh, allow, uh, allow them to perform adequately. It's just that the way for them to get there um, is different from the, uh, the children who were taken out earlier and who were able to develop these more adaptive strategies. Now, what that, <laughs> what that speaks to is the um, the need to have finer measurement, right? not only in the brain, but also finer uh, measurement of behavior so that we can break down. So IQ is a sort of a, you know, uh, a general, you know, large and diffuse concept. And really what we need is much finer 
uh, behavioral analysis as well as you know neural analysis that would allow us to break down what are the individual uh, competencies or the individual brain networks that are associated much like the study that you you just talked about what, what are the individual networks or individual you know behavioral com uh, competencies that allow for performance and I think there you know you're probably right that we would still see differences within the foster care group between those taken out before and after 24 months it's a great point and uh, we need to be able to do that in order to answer our own question. Thank you. Hi there, I don't need the microphone. I'm the adoptive mother of two children from China. One, was brought to uh, an orphanage at one month of age, and then I adopted that child at seven. The other one was um, brought to the orphanage when they were about four years old. They initially lived with their families, and I can see a huge difference between my two children, not only in their behavior and their language, um, or how they figure things out, their reasoning, and what you've presented helps me understand a lot about what's going on in their minds and how their minds are functioning. My older daughter, who's currently a student here at Gallaudet, um, you can see from what you've said, a lot of what you've said parallels and it m helps it make sense because she didn't have proper language stimulation when she was very young. She didn't have that sort of exposure. She had the, her change of caregivers was frequent. She had multiple nannies. So she didn't have stability in who her caregiver was when she was younger and you see a number of deficits in her ability to empathize, but she's catching up. So my question is, will she ever get caught up uh -huh. with those of us who were born and raised in our families? You know, will she ever perform somewhat normally? I mean, she, you know, was, you said that if kids are taken out roughly before the age of two, that they're, um, they'll be fine, but then sometimes you don't see people get adopted until they're 12, 13 yeah. years old. I mean, can they ever get caught up? And I understand that measures like IQ are kind of, um, you know, ambiguous. I mean, how do you measure IQ when they don't understand what's happened prior to that? Yeah. Um, well, it's, thank you for your comment. And it's a wonderful, wonderful story. The, the answer I is that, uh, you know, if, if developmental psychologists were able to predict at the individual level, we'd all be extraordinarily wealthy. Um, but we can't because right. there are right. so many uh, uh, factors that go in to the trajectories of individual children and their response to adversity. So our, our data are at the group level and we obviously see that, um, that at the group level there are significant effects of this early deprivation and neglect. But even within the children, I don't know if you noticed, even within the children who were randomized and remained in the institution, um, there were some children that had increasing IQ scores uh, over, over time. And so there are individual differences um, right. that uh, which we don't really, can't really identify what those individual differences are that may in fact underlie success uh, and, and competence uh, and adaptability of, of, uh, of individual children over time. And I don't know if that's a satisfactory it, answer. But. Well, I mean, as a mother, how can I be satisfied? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Right. I mean, really. No, but, but yeah, so essentially the point is that children can be adaptive, but what I've seen is that really those who are adopted um, don't seem to have the greatest ability to be adaptive, just frankly. It seems like there's a great deal of tension that's always underlying what they do, and I think that that's part of because nobody's really prepared them 
Uh, nobody's you know, said, hey, this is going to happen in life, and when that happens, you can do this. Or even if they said, you might go to a new mom and dad, and then if they come to US, the U.S. or wherever their adoptive families are, I don't know that they've been prepared for that, and I wonder if that has an impact on the ultimate outcome and if what happened yeah. earlier in life really plays a big role. Yeah, I, 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 think that, uh, I think that you're correct. Even within the, the United States in terms of national adoption, there are issues for uh, children and families in terms of the relationship that they establish, even if they are adopted you know, soon after birth in terms of the psychological relationship between an adopted parent and an adopted child. And that is all the more complicated and complex when that child comes from a different culture um, and when that child has experienced different forms of adversity uh, early in life. The best thing we can say is that there are um, you know, in, important individual differences that sustain uh, some children to be successful and adaptive uh, then how, over time. How do, you measure, how do you measure that gray and white matter in their brains when, when that's happening? Um, oh, well, I mean, measuring the gray and white matter is, is the easy part. I mean, we, can, we do something called structural MRI. We, do a, we use an MRI machine, and we look at the, the, inc the amount of gray and, and white matter in their brain. But I'll, I, I just want to say something that even with these differences in gray and white matter that I, that I showed, that's not, that, that in itself will not explain who's going to go on to uh, adapt and be successful and who will not. There, there, just, there are multiple factors at the individual level um, that need to be accounted for, not the least of which is the the kind of support that the child gets post-adoption and the kind of family that the child goes into post-adoption. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That was an absolutely fascinating talk and very thought-provoking. And um, this is more of a comment, but I thought I'd share with you that you were saying that one of the profound relevance of this is the, that we can gain insight into the impact of neglect, neglect in um, mm -hmm. child development. One of the things we see is, um, so this concept of neglect is a, a very interesting concept because that's a, that's a situation, these children were absolutely clearly in this social, socially um, deprived, socially attenuated, a neglectful context. But we, we see children uh, showing dramatic impact similar to yours with regard to language and reading and higher cognitive processing when neglect is not your classic construct. So they are from nice middle class homes, these are deaf children. Typically, um, they are, have hearing parents, and they're going to get cochlea implants. And these parents have the best intentions and give them all the baby Einstein toys, but the medical institution has told these parents, do not expose these children to sign language. So it's not negle neglect in your classic case. They're not socially neglected, but they're linguistically deprived. Mm -hmm. So this is like a, a select column of human interaction has been significantly withheld. So now these children are going to get a cochlear implant at 12 months and 18 months old. And if it's at 12 months, it's not tuned and ready to go until around 18 months. So from birth to 18 months, there's there's a kind of neglect. They have not had the input of, ling of a systematic linguistic input. So then, while they had all the social love and rich, in, you know, richness, human brain, the human brain can be impacted if it's just something like withholding of the timing of the ex 
experience and exposure to language. So these children have telltale indices of having had this late exposure to the patterns of language that really impact reading and then cascading impact uh, other uh, um, cognitive growth factors. So I just find it fascinating that neglect could be social or you can have social rich, rich environment but you don't get language and still see a devastating ripple effect. Okay. So two, two comments on your comment. Um, the first is one of the things that I didn't mention in, the, in my introductory remarks. There's a wonderful paper, 1983 I think, in child development by a neuroscientist by the name of William Bill Greeno. <clears throat> and the paper was about experience expectant versus experience dependent learning. Experience expectant learning or exposure meant that the brain is expecting a certain type of input. When it doesn't get that input, what happens, right? So there may be a sensitive period during which that input needs to, needs to occur. And if it doesn't occur or if it occurs later, it will have cascading effects downstream. Um, the data that I showed you from Daphne Maurer's study with children who had uh, different ages in which they had, they had bilateral cataracts and then the cataracts were removed is ex an example of that. And it's similar, seems to me, to the data that you told us about in terms of uh, uh, deaf children not being exposed to language uh, up through the first 18 months of life. Similar in the sense that here's another domain, like vision, that the brain is expecting a certain type of, a certain level of experience, and it's not getting it, right? And wh whether it gets it or not at a later age, it may compensate, but there are going to be, as in Daphne's, where I showed you those sleeper effects, there are going to be cascading effects downstream in terms of development and behavior. We have time for one more question, or two if they're short. Um, and before we finish up the question and answers, I want to remind everyone that we have a small reception after this, just over in the SLCC uh, atrium, so just across the way. Come and join us and we can continue the conversation there um, with some food and drinks. So um, one more question here. <laughs> you think you could both have quite, you can both ask your We questions. can do too, but Zach Alaria already had a question, so come on up. Earlier today, we were talking about some research from your project um, that you continue to do where you're following up with these children who are, I believe you said, 16 now. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind, could you maybe talk a little bit about uh, what your expectations are for the study ongoing? Sure. So 16, 15 and 16, which is the age that we're seeing them now, is deepest and darkest adolescence. Um, and um, you know, there are some people that argue that adolescence is another sensitive period um, in brain development in the sense that, the, that there are experiences that are expected to occur during that period of time, hormonal changes that affect brain structure and, and organization. So where we are asking whether or not um, the effects of early adversity um, uh, have cascading influences and heighten uh, what are the uh, typical uh, kinds of behaviors that are seen uh, in adolescence. So, for example, risk-taking, um, externalizing kinds of behavior, um, and other forms of psychopathology that are generally uh, emerge in the adolescent period, are those, uh, are those forms of psychopathology and behavior, are they enhanced 
in this group of children? Um, or are they diminished as a function of these earlier uh, adverse experiences? And, and so that's one primary uh, issue that we are, or that we're quite interested in. At the 50, 60. Yes, you had a question? Come on, come on down. Thank you for your talk. Um, I might be completely off base with my thinking here, and if so, just tell me. I'm thinking about what if the whole thing is a defense? Meaning, like, say that the brain's responses and activity in the brain is such that in and of itself, it is a defense. So I'm thinking about if I had grown up um, having primarily visual experiences and then say that I go to a place where everyone speaks and I can't participate in their language, I would be so completely at a loss, I wouldn't know how to interact. But if I were in the same sort of state, always having a visual experience, then it wouldn't be um, anything different. So do you think it's something about a deficiency or a defense? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, uh, uh, and I do think that there are um, uh, behaviors that children who have experienced neglect and adversity, uh, and particularly institutionalization, that they exhibit, which are, I don't even know that I would call them a defense, I would call them an adapt, uh, adaptation that they have to the context in which they're living. The best example, which I really s skipped over very quickly, is this indiscriminate behavior. So parents who have adopted children from institutions report anecdotally that children um, will walk off with anybody who gives them their hand. Somebody sticks out their hand and the child uh, will walk off with them. And they also report that the children are not, um, they don't seem warm and don't bond easily with their caregiver. Now, if you're a child growing up in an institution and somebody, stranger they may be, sticks out their hand and says, come with me, if you don't go with them, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, you, so your adaptation to that environment is to walk off with whoever it is who stick in their hand out and saying, saying, come with me. We have multiple instances of children who have uh, adapted their brain and behavioral responses to the context in which, uh, in which they're living. I don't know that I would call, uh, you know, you might think of it as a defensive response, but really what it is is a defensive response against the adverse context in which they're growing up. So I don't think you're off base. In fact, I think it very much sort of tells the story of why the children respond to the context in which they're, in the ways that they do. Thank you. Sure. so well with what you were talking about. I couldn't resist. So uh, I want to ask you a question about the study on the stress where you asked uh, the kids to do a presentation, uh, perform math, and you yeah. measured their stress response. And yeah. here is the question that I had is uh, the kids that were in the institute had a very low stress response. And right. my question was, is it habituation? Is it adaptation? Because they've been so much stressed in their previous uh, past that maybe they're just not reacting. It's not a really stressful situation to them. Stranger people come by every time. Or is it really a physiological change that really makes them insensitive to situations that should stress them and therefore might explain future yeah. uh, misbehavior in adolescence or in young adulthood? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Uh, we don't know the answer. Um, but what we do know is that um, uh, that, that hypo-responsive that hypo-responsivity could be, 
you know, the, the HPA axis and the autonomic nervous system involved in stress is a regulatory, uh, uh, I guess, homeostatic system which shuts off when it gets too high and then, uh, and then comes back on when it's, when it's needed. And so the dampening down and the hyporesponsiveness could be that it has chronically been stressed and so it is shut down. Um, the, there was early, there was work some 30 years ago on depression um, that thought that uh, individuals who are chronically de depressed, that their, H their, their stress system had also shut down. And there was, in fact, a test called the dexamo dexamethasone suppression test, which was a challenge to the uh, stress system to see whether or not it would elevate in response to that challenge, and in depressed individuals, it apparently did not. So it may, in fact, be that, that it has shut down as a function of that habituation. You know, one of the things that we didn't do and that we sort of hit our heads saying that we should have done is measure stress reactivity at earlier points in time. Because in doing that, we could have looked at the developmental trajectory and at factors that were associated with uh, either that habituation or that shutdown. So we'll never be able to answer that, that question, but it's really, you know, right on in terms of the mark in terms of understanding sort of the mechanisms by which, uh, you know, these children's behavior emerges. Anyone else? Thank you for all your great questions. Really appreciate them. Um, please, now come join us and we can have some more informal discussion. Thank and you. And make sure to fill out your evaluation forms and hand them in to us. Thank you.